This is Twit. It's an interesting story, and they're calling it the Big Glass Wars, which is a, a great title. Mm. Can you tell us what that is and why it's important? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, in the 90s and the early part of this century, you know, astronomers around the world, places like Carnegie and Caltech, completed kind of the first big generation of telescopes since really Palomar and, and things from like the 50, 40s, 50s, and 60s. So things like Keck and, and our Magellan telescopes. And it became very apparent. We learned a lot from these telescopes. They're amazing facilities. Um, and But it became apparent right away that, you know, bigger glass is needed. You know, astronomy is all about collecting light. Uh, I always tell people, you know, if you're uh, if you're going to collect rain, you want a bigger bucket. And same thing with light, right? We need a bigger bucket always uh, to, to really get the fainter things um, in the sky. And so, you know, we uh, at Carnegie, we started planning the next generation telescope for Las Capanas in the early part of the century. Similarly, our, our colleagues at Caltech and UC had started their uh, 30 meter telescope, which is supposed to be a Mauna Kea. And so these telescopes have kind of been chugging along for 20, 20, over 20 years now, and have built up some really kind of big private partnerships. Um, in the case of the Giant Magellan Telescope, we have a bunch of universities, University of Arizona, Texas, Chicago, Harvard, uh, um, those sorts of places, plus countries like South Korea, Australia for us, Brazil. Um, and then of course the TMT on the other side, Caltech has partners in Japan, Canada, and India. And so um, these te- we've raised huge amounts of money for these telescopes. These new next generation of beasts are so expensive because they're really huge. I mean, the 30 meter, as you can guess, is a 30 meter telescope. Uh, the GMT is a 25 meter telescope. These are tremendously large uh, facilities and the engineering behind them is incredible. So we've been kind of chugging along for, for a while on our own. But it's, you know, become apparent at some point that um, at, simultaneously, I should say, the Europeans have been building the EELT, which is a 39 meter telescope. And that telescope um, will, will be located in Chile. So um, it became apparent, uh, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago, that for us to complete these telescopes, we really did need um help from the NSF, from the National Science Foundation, to help make them happen. In other words, we needed the U.S. government to participate in some way. As I I just mentioned, um, you know, both uh, TMT and GMT have huge international partners. And in those cases, the countries like Australia and South Korea are participating. But up until this point, the U.S. has not. It's really just been the private institutions. So... um, Anyhow, so it became very clear that uh, to finish these telescopes and to give astronomers across the United States access to them, um, really we needed the the, um, funding from the National Science Foundation. I I should, let me just as a side note, say why it's important for an astronomer outside of Caltech and Carnegie, for instance, to have access to these telescopes. Because there are many places that, of course, where there are young astronomers trying to get their PhDs or even undergraduate degrees. And, you know, if they don't have access to these telescopes, they really cannot do the cutting edge astronomy that people can do at for, at a place like Caltech or, or, or UC Berkeley or a place like that. And so with the NSF coming in, the idea is that this would open the facility up to astronomers throughout the country. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the U.S. community does its every 10 year, its decadal survey where we rank kind of what are the top priorities in astronomy. And in the 2021, the, these two telescopes came out number one. And, and they decided that for the U.S. to remain competitive, the NSF has to help fund these. We have to finish these, particularly with Europe moving very fast on theirs. But, so that's the... Go ahead. Go sorry. ahead. No, uh, I was going to say that's... Go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> just just going to ask a quick question to make sure I've got this right, because it's kind of hard to believe, because I grew up you know, hearing about the the massive 200 inch telescope at Palomar and what amazing engineering achievement that was. A 30 meter telescope is 3,540 inches. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it's crazy. These things are, yes, these things, um, I, I, our current telescope, so the GMT has seven very large mirrors, each about 25 feet across. So each mirror for the GMT is already as kind of the size of the biggest telescopes we have in the world. I mean, and there's seven of them. So, you, I mean, you just think of the collecting area, remember, is, <laughs> is, is the area of all that. I mean, we are making a huge uh, leap here to do these sorts of things. And so, um, well, in the case of like the GMT, I, if I remember correctly, the dome is, I think, 24 stories high. 
Oh I mean, to give you an idea of the, <laughs> of the scale, it's incredible. The hole in the middle mirror for the GMT is the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. Just the hole wow. in the Lycos. So, it's I mean, deep. there's all these sorts of oh things. Yeah, it's like, it's it's a little crazy how um, uh, how these things go. So these are these are amazing facilities. And let me just also take a second to say why we need them. I mean, I think um, we've made a lot of progress in the last 20 years. It really has been kind of the golden um, ages of astronomy. Uh, and in addition to the ground-based telescopes, you know, of course we have the amazing Hubble Space Telescope and now the James Webb. And I'm, we should probably talk about that because people often ask me, why, why not do everything in space? And the answer is right. pretty easy. It's, it's hard and expensive, but uh, <laughs> space would be great if you could do it always. But, um, you know, to get to this next level, to really do some of the most fundamental questions we're interested in, you really need this big glass. Um, and I'll, I'll just give two examples. The, the one that I think is the primary driver for many people right now is the search for Earth-like planets. Um, you hear on the news all the time. In fact, there was just a story yesterday, you know, planet like Earth. Well, we had to be really careful. Those aren't really Earth-like planets. Those are planets that might be the size of the Earth. They're around very low mass stars, red stars, which tend to be very unstable. They're, they're not like, it's not a situation with a star like the sun and an Earth at the right distance for life to happen. To see those planets, the really Earth-like planets around stars like the sun, uh, none of the current telescopes can do that. This is something this next generation will be necessary for. And we're really interested, of course, in studying the atmospheres of those planets to look for evidence of life, biosignatures. And that's the other thing. These, that is probably the primary driver, I think, for the big telescopes right now. Um, I'm a galaxy guy. Um, I like to study. I like to study galaxies. It's pretty much been my career since my one solar paper um, back in 1989. And so, of course, James Webb is finding these amazing uh, first kind of the very first galaxies we're seeing. And James Webb can detect them and we can learn a little bit about them. But to really understand what they're made of, what the stars are made of, it's just not a big enough telescope. And so these telescopes, that's the other area. I think those those two areas kind of nearby would be looking for those Earth-like planets and then looking at the very, very distant universe to understand the first stars and galaxies. It's super exciting, I think. And, and so you, but you really need the big glass to do that. And I did, I did some math uh, while, while you were giving us that uh, really, wow. you know, <laughs> uh, by, by doing that, I meant I typed into Google, how, how many feet <laughs> are these? And just, just to put it into perspective for folks that maybe aren't on metric that, so GMT yes. is 25, 25.4 meters uh, 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 for, for your mirror. That's like more than eight, just over 80, 83 80. feet. Yeah. And and of course the, the the thirty meter telescope is is just just under a hundred feet, which is absolutely crazy. The Keck telescopes are what ten meters, right? They're ten uh, meters, for, yeah, yeah, right. For comparison, yeah. but these so, are segmented uh, rears, right? It's not one big piece of glass like Tom that. Was. In both cases, they're segmented. So the 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 telescopes are a little different in style. Um, the thirty meter uses it's basically a, it uses the Keck technology, which is a bunch of small mirrors. The GMT, our Giant Magellan Telescope, uses seven very big mirrors, uh, but they are, you have to be segmented. There's just no way to build an 80 foot mirror. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, you can do it with lots of little mirrors or some big mirrors and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, which is one reason why having both would be super exciting because there's things that the GMT will be able to do. There's things that the TMT will be able to do. Uh, if the U S community had access to both, this really gives us an upper edge on, uh, on, you know, the competition from around the world. And, and by having multiple segments, you're able to tweak them a bit to better cancel out the atmospheric effect. Is is that the goal, or is it just just to get the biggest light collecting uh, uh, surface area that you're trying well, to? Well, yeah. So the primary thing is to get the collecting area, just to get the big. But but you're right. By having the mirrors, you know the mirrors are deformable, which means they move. This is something even our current telescopes do. I don't think people realize the technology is amazing. There's there's all this pressure being put on on the underside of the mirror. So that the mirrors aren't really just a, a surface like this. They actually are moving um, little bits and pieces to at, to um, basically work as the atmosphere changes. We're correcting for that in real time. And so that's why you can deliver really good images. Um, and and then, yeah. and then just I guess and I, I, I apologize if, 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 they, if these sound like really like bonehead questions, but no, is it just you know the fact that bigger is better and that with more surface area for these mirrors mm -hmm. you get to see sharper than keck images you get to see farther uh, uh planets or, or 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 satellites i mean it, that's the depth that that's the that's the advantage the leap mm -hmm. that that you and 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 the, the and carnegie are looking 
to achieve right. with these, these next generation telescopes themselves? Yeah. So, um, both factors, in fact. So, um, the collecting area is literally just the size. And so, you know, 80, 80, an 80 foot telescope is a lot better than a 10 foot telescope, for instance, right? So there you're just collecting, you're collecting more rain. In our case, that rain is light or photons. Um, but it turns out that the bigger the mirror is, the higher resolution you get. And so, in fact, you also get higher, you're getting a sharper image in a sense. So, in fact, these telescopes, when you correct for the atmosphere, actually get better image quality than James Webb or wow. Hubble. So um, the key is you have to correct for the atmosphere because the, the, even though the mirrors would give you better quality, the atmosphere blurs that. And so, but we, by correcting for that, um, we actually will get better quality images than we can get from space, which is really remarkable. And, right. and I, oh, do, do you want to? Do you want to ask? I was going to ask a quick one about cost, just because I feel like that's going to be yes. a really important thing Go for, for our that's next section. One. That's a good one. Rod and I have talked a lot about uh, the human spaceflight side of things, uh, John, mm -hmm. uh, and how you know we could have been at the moon with like NASA's old plan when it was going to cost a hundred billion, but no one wanted to pay for it, even though they knew yeah. what the price tag was, and they said it was going to take ten years, and you got to take you got to spend the money. Uh, the government never actually put that money in, and then everyone's surprised when we don't have a spaceship. Uh, you know, how, you know, how could we see this coming? Uh, right. <laughs> but, but uh, for 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 your project for GMT for the thirty meter telescope, the the price the the the, the tags have been the the funding was was pretty pretty much upfront two point five billion for yeah. a giant Magellan telescope three point nine billion for thirty meter telescope. Mm -hmm. It's a national priority from the the, the National Academy of Sciences and Astro twenty twenty. Yes, it's number one. Let's go and fund it. And then now, kind of the big thing is the the National uh, Science Foundation is saying, like, well, we've got one point what one point six billion. That's it. That's all we've got to spend. That's that's the pot. So we, yeah. you know, that's where we find ourselves in. And I'm just wondering how much of a shock that is when clearly it's it's been no secret how much they, right. they, you know and 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 why you require that type of funding because these are not like backyard telescopes or anywhere right. anything close to it these are really precision machines mm. i mean this is your space shuttle or uh, or 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 whatnot yeah. i don't know if i want to uh, uh uh put words in your mouth or, or or whatnot but i mean i'm just curious uh you know when they say well how much is it going to cost what you tell people uh, about what they're getting from that yeah no i think that that's a really great question because they're not cheap i'm not i'm not going to say they're cheap but they are a bargain and I'll t I, the reason I, th I feel they're a bargain is because we already have private uh We've privately raised, you know, about half the money in both cases. That's an amazing contribution. Usually, uh, a lot of NSF projects, you know, we expect the federal government to pay for the whole thing. That was the case, for instance, for ALMA um, or the Vera Rubin Observatory. In those cases, almost all that money has come from federal agencies, and those those were in the billion dollar plus range mm -hmm. as individual facilities. And of course, they've been, you know, in the case of ALMA, it's been online for over a decade. So, you know, that would end up being a, a one and a half or two billion dollar project now. Um, in this case, the partnerships here are really bringing forward a lot of money. I mean, it ends up being, you know, I don't know, two, two and a half billion dollars or something. So that's why they're a bargain. Uh, they're, they are expensive. I mean, these are, you know, you, you, you said those numbers and those are the numbers. Um, the one thing I'll say is that these telescopes, of course, once you build them last, you know, I mean, this, these things are going to be operating 50, 60 years. So it is kind of a big, big upfront expense of one time, but, um, they're expensive, but, um, if you want to do exciting things, you know, you have to invest in them. And I, mm -hmm. and I think it's all relative, of course, right? It, compared to, you know, uh, something the military does or something, this is pretty small money. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I'll point out is that compared to space, it's very small money. So, you know, people are probably familiar with the James Webb Space Telescope, which I would say anything bad about it because it is an amazing <laughs> facility. And all I've talked about, I've been giving talks around town for the last two years all about James Webb. It is so exciting. But it was ten billion dollars right. of, of federal money. So what we're talking here is a small fraction. Um, if you even if you funded both of that, and um, and you know, uh, I think there's a great case for the James Webb Space Telescope, and it's doing amazing things. Well, but these ground-based telescopes, there is there great... is now that it's working in space, John. Well, that's right. That's <laughs> right. And and I'll remind people that well, I don't know if people know, but you know, when it was when we were first talking about James Webb, early part of the century. It was quoted to be half a half a billion dollars, and all of us were like, "There is no way this is going to be a half a billion dollars," and you know, so it ended up being closer to ten. And even and operating it, of course, is also an additional expense, much more severe than 
than what we have. The advantage that ground-based telescopes have is that we can change the instrumentation, and so we'll be continually updating them. The telescopes, you know, tell, I always tell people, the telescopes really, if you, if you take care of them, really last forever. Those telescopes at Mount Wilson, you know, some of them, they're over 100 years now. If they were not at Mount Wilson, uh, which is in Los Angeles, um, you, you, in fact, you still can do things with them, right? But I mean, really, you could be changing the instrumentation. Um, one of the challenges with space is that, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope now has technology that's almost 20 years old in terms of its detectors and things of that sort. We can do much better. So on the ground, we can continually update our instrumentation. And, and that is one of the real advantages of being on the ground. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>